very much, John, for the introduction. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, something slightly different, um, and also slightly different for me because I spent a lot of time working in the Baltic with Verena as well on some of these castles, and they had very nice pollen in them as well that she chose to ignore. Um, <laughs> but I'm not bitter, so. Um, but what I'm going to try and do in this talk is just give you a little bit of um, uh, an insight into some of the, the work, the geoarchaeological work that Wessex Archaeology are doing in the maritime zone. So just to give you a little bit of a background, Wessex Archaeology are one of the three biggest commercial archaeological units in the UK, um, but they do a lot of work within the uh, coastal and maritime zone. So we have a geoservices department, there are about 35 of us working in there, variously across marine um, and coastal geophysics, terrestrial geophysics, geoarchaeology um, and environmental work and I'm within the geoarchaeological part of it but um, my remit sort of extends uh, more broadly than that so I've been very um, lucky to work on some of these marine uh, sites as well. I mean it's essentially the same stuff but just covered in, in water really. Um, and I'm, I'm employed there as the, uh, the senior geoarch. I've been there for uh, the last year and a half after um, spending about um, 10 or 11 years at Reading doing research. So I think there's a, a general appreciation within the academic community, perhaps a little bit less so amongst the public, that actually there are, there are large parts of the continental shelves that were surrounding the uh, current land masses that were actually exposed, aerially exposed to varying degrees. Um, in the Earth's path, particularly during the glacial low stand, so those periods uh, in between the ice ages. And in the context of the North Sea, they've been making archaeological discoveries uh, in the North Sea for um, a century or more, uh, you know, sort of Paleolithic and Mesolithic in date, and then more recent sort of maritime finds, shipwrecks, things of that nature, you know, so fishermen trawling up finds. And, and the significance of these finds wasn't lost on the people that report in them, the archaeologists at the time. But it's, it's sort of fair to say that academic interest in, in these submerged landscapes was, was sort of lulled during most of the 20th century. And it wasn't until um, a seminal article by uh, Bryony Coles at the very, very end of the 20th century on revisiting Doggerland that sort of started to sort of re-energise uh, interest in these um, landscapes. And one of the key things that came out of that article was the idea that we shouldn't see the North Sea simply as a, a land bridge between continental Europe and Britain, but as an actively inhabited landscape. And that's really been um, borne out by a lot of the work. And so we have uh, land surfaces that are can be found down to 120 metres below the modern uh, sea level. They've got the potential to yield archaeological sites that date back to 800,000 years ago. And a lot of this initial work was undertaken in the context of the oil and the gas industry, um, aggregate dredging, and more recent, recently a lot of um, offshore developments, including uh, wind farms. And these have uh, significant potential, really, to inform us about past sea level rise, climate change, um, and the impact of those processes on, on human communities. And the, the last one of those is a, really a little bit more of a, a, a challenge for us. To give you a bit of a broader uh, time scale to this, although I'm really going to be only focusing on um, that little squidgy bit at the end, um, the main thing to take away from this is actually that Britain... Um, as an area has been part of um, the European continental shelf for the vast majority of this time period. It's really a peninsula at the northwestern um, part of the, the European continent. The Dover Straits were only broken about 450,000 years ago and after that Britain has only existed as an island for very short periods of that um, during interglacial periods and there have been successive waves of immigration, migration into the UK and that's played an important part in the cultural development of Britain. Um, so Brexit supporters can take that how they like. <laughs> so there's important pieces of work like the Marine Aggregates Levy Sustainability Fund. So this was a levy that was raised against the aggregate industry uh, trying to mitigate some of the impact. This included a series of uh, regional environmental characterization zones. I won't go too much into these, but it involved a lot of um, examination of curated data, and there were sort of some more limited attempts to ground truth the 
geophysical data, but as it stands, we still have a relatively small number of um, detailed paleoenvironmental studies from this landscape. So although we, we have a good, broad understanding of the paleotopography of this landscape, we, we lack the sort of more detailed investigations, but I think that's um, really just a matter of time. And so you can just see from this um, map just the scale of the offshore works that are occurring around the British coastline. I don't think these are necessarily all um, projects that Wessex are working on, um, but a lot of them are, are big uh, sort of wind farm projects. And of course they also have uh, export cable routes that then connect up to cable routes on land. So there's a huge amount of work involved in this. For the site, one of the sites that I'm talking about, Dudgeon, um, this is how um, they go out, take the cores, um, on board boats. They normally either come back as enclosed cores or as samples in bags. Um, sometimes there aren't geoarchaeologists that are embedded on these ships, it's just uh, geotechnical crews. They may be taking cores down to 70 metres below the seabed, so the Holocene and late Pleistocene stuff is really sort of the, the gack on the top, so we really need to sort of highlight to them the sort of material that we're interested in, in looking at so they can retain it. But there's so much material being, being taken from offshore sites and there's, there's not enough storage space onshore that they're simply recording this and, and slinging a lot of it over overboard. So it's really important that we retain as much of this uh, interest in material as possible. So the site that I'm mainly going to be talking about, Dudgeon, uh, it's about 30 kilometres off the, the east coast of uh, England. And you see here, this is sort of the, the edge of the wind farm array. Um, and a lot of these, these features that have been picked up by uh, geophysical survey, and then we've got coring points um, pretty much in a, in a grid associated with all of the, the wind turbines, and then the export um, cable route. And what we've got from the, the sort of broader geophysical uh, surveys of this area is you can see all these sort of linear um, northwest southeast trending features. These are sort of large. Um, subglacial valleys that formed during the Anglian glaciation, so about 470 to 420,000 years ago. So they were, they were either formed underneath the ice sheet or at the margin or through sort of big water um, outbursts. And some of these are exceptionally deep, like the Silver Pit, I mean it's over 200 metres um, deep at the maximum. But we have these more sort of shallow seismic survey where you can see these um, pallia channels underneath the modern seabed infilled with Holocene sediment and uh, late glacial sediment, and those are really the, the, the sort of interesting areas that we can target in this area up here, as, um, which I'm going to be looking at when I, when I get back from uh, this conference, has some Hoxnian in, um, interglacial material in, uh, preserved in it. Um, I'll skirt over this, but this, these are some of these subglacial valleys, so you can see here this is 200 metres, so there's really deep features, and they're infilled with later sort of Wollstonian um, complex sediments and then with a very thin veneer of much more recent Holocene material. Um, so the core from Dudgeon, um, it's one, one core in particular where we've identified uh, potential sort of uh, peat deposits in, in filling a pallia channel or it was a pallia channel as suggested by the geophysics but we think it's actually a small proglacial lake and we've got this sequence of Gitcher and peat um, that dates between about 12,700 and 9,300. So often we're, we're getting pallid channels that are preserving early Holocene peaks, but here we've got this late glacial early Holocene sequence, so it's quite significant. And then overlying that is seven and a half metres of shelly sandy gravels, and then another thin peat on top of that that dates to 8,400 and about 8,300. And we've done a fairly standardised set of techniques uh, on this. I don't want to dwell too much on the, the paleoenvironmental evidence, particularly the, the, the vegetation evidence. It conforms to what we understand about the development of plant communities um, over the late glacial and early Holocene. Um, but I said that we had this, this pro-glacial lake. It's fed by um, fresh waters, perhaps from the retreating uh, Devensian ice sheet. But it's essentially sort of an open, tall, short, um, subalpine grassland environment with some fen habitats. If there was any wood, it was sort of a um, dwarf birch environment. So not too dissimilar to this um, picture here. And then obviously the Holocene represents a major 
um, uh, change in the environment. Obviously, we have climatic warming. We have an expansion of woodland, birch, and then hazel. Grassland forms a very uh, minor component of the vegetation. But what we see towards the top of this peak is actually a shift to sort of intertidal and nearshore environments. So salt marsh, mud flats, um, environments of that nature. And so this is at around about 9,300 cal um, BP. And the dates that we have for the final inundation of Doggerland date to around about 7,300 cal BP. So this is 2,000 years before that. And I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. And then these seven metres of shelly sandy gravels overlying that, which we've had a look at the, the mollusks from, suggests it's basically a shallow marine environment. So we've got a shift from a freshwater, open grassland, uh, fen environment, through to intertidal nearshore environments and a full uh, marine environment. But this, this very thin peaked horizon that we have at the the top of this sequence obviously it sort of reflects a shift back to either stable or perhaps even slightly uh, falling fall in sea levels. The, the date of it is significant um, because it's very close in time into the 8.2 event. So for those of you who are perhaps not familiar we have two uh, major sort of geological events that are occurring at this time. We have the Storega um, event which was a huge submarine landslide off the coast of Norway and that caused a huge tsunami and we see deposits um, about 20 centimetres thick, coarse mineralogenic deposits sort of along Fair Islands, the coast of uh, Scotland um, in the ensuing tsunami. There's no evidence from the southern North Sea Basin that we, we have any impact to that tsunami. Um, that doesn't mean that it um, doesn't exist but we've just not really found it at this time. And then at the same time uh, the the 8.2 event that's all it's called is meant to be a phase of climatic cooling that occurred over a period of about 200 years and it's uh, generally agreed that it's a result of the collapse of the Laurentide ice sheet that was um, over North America and these two um, large proglacial lakes essentially just drained out into the North Atlantic so you have a, a pulse uh, a meltwater pulse and a big rise in sea levels and they think that we have probably a two metre rise in sea levels against a background rise of two metres. So it's a significant increase in sea levels. And uh, there's been some work that's been done in the rhine Mers uh, Delta that was published probably five or six years ago. And what that was suggesting on dates from basal peats in this, in this area, this, this date here, that we probably have a two-stage drainage event that's beginning around 8.5. So the date that we have uh, which is around 8,400 8, to 8,300 sort of fits very nicely within that bracket. So what we're looking at is a period of, of really of gradual um, but rapid post-glacial sea level rise punctuated and, and modulated by these sort of more rapid pulses of sea level rise caused by things like the, the collapse of the uh, Laurentide ice sheet and that had a ensuing climatic impact as well. Um, and I sort of, the bottom line, I sort of posed a question about whether this sea level rise really had a significant impact on the communities that were, were living in this area. Um, when I'd initially given this, I said had a significant impact, but given a little bit more time to think about it, I think it requires a li little bit more careful thought, and I, I'll come back to that at the, at the end. Now, work by um, Stephen Shannon um, back at the beginning of the um, of the millennium he suggested that what you had was the the development of this western embayment along the east coast of England uh, perhaps as early as 10,000 BP but certainly by about 9,000 BP um, but at this stage, stage of course there wasn't really a, a huge amount of data in or paleoenvironmental data to support that but actually the data that we're getting from Dudgeon which is pretty much located um, about here would rather support his model that we've got this development of an embayment and the creation of these sort of intertidal and, and marine environments whilst the this area of uh, Doggerland would have remained largely above uh, water and, for, and wouldn't have been inundated for a, a couple of thousand um, uh, years. So I wanted to bring in um, a couple of other uh, sites that I'm working on um, out in the the Thames estuary so we have the London array which is this site I think I think it's the largest uh, wind farm array in the world 
uh, with the, the export cable route and then the Nemo link which is an electrical um, interconnector cable that, that stretches to Belgium. Um, and we have three cores from here. They're generally dating, uh, they're, but they're essentially peats that are cool, preserved within Holocene Paleo channels. Um, and one of these, uh, core V06 from the export cable route, has a peat that dates to 8,500 8, to 8,400. So again, uh, dating broadly to that period of the 8.2 event. Um, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that we're we're getting these samples. I mean, we've got a whole series of former land surfaces that are being choked off and inundated. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we're preserving these sites, but we've, we've really got isolated dates spread around the North Sea. And the idea is really to start to bring, bring together these dates to understand this, this model of sea level rise. So I'm gonna finish off on this slide really and to, to think really about how this process of sea level rise impacted um, on Mesolithic communities. And there's been relatively little discussion about, um, about this, this area. Jim Leary from um, Reading University has published a number of articles on this. It's important to say that in terms of archaeology, it's challenging because any archaeological finds we have are, are simply chance finds, you know, whether they're dredged up or, um, or found in cores. I mean, they're you know, in situ stratified archaeological sites are exceptionally rare. But the question is, is whether this process of sea level rise was perceptible. We're probably dealing with about 26 metres of sea level rise, um, as I put um, here over this period between 10,200 and 7,000. Uh, 400, and it equates to roughly about 12 to 13 millimetres of sea level rise a year. So over the lifespan of a hunter-gatherer, you're probably talking about 40 centimetres of sea level rise. But is that still something that's going to be perceptible to these mobile hunter-gatherer communities? I mean, it's perhaps sea level rise that's going to be more perceptible in low-lying areas around incipient estuary mouths, but were they simply adapted to something that was a natural part of their their lifestyle? You know, did they have adaptive capacities in terms of mobility, in terms of flexible resource use, um, in terms <coughs> of uh, social interaction with other groups? You know, was this a uh, was this something that that significantly impacted them? Um, and and I think this is something that's quite. Um, difficult to answer and we can use the material that we have from onshore environments as well but I think this is something that as we get more data we need to actually get a get a handle of because there's a real um, tendency I think for academics to talk about sea level rise in terms of catastrophic sea level rise and you've got you know 60 meters of sea level rise and you know were communities resilient and how adaptable were they and I think we can implant our own experiences of living in very sedentary urban environments back onto these communities that are actually a bit more flexible and adaptable to their environment so I, I really question whether these um, whether Mesolithic communities were impacted in a, in a wholly negative sense. As some habitats were lost, other new ones would have been created. And did they simply have a, a, a very high adaptive capacity to deal with these changes in their environment? And it really raises lessons uh, for us in our um, urban societies to um, how we're going to deal with the impact of future sea level rise, which at the moment is about a global average of uh, three millimetres a year. Um, so hopefully that's it's given you a bit of a an, an insight into some of the work we're doing. It was a bit bit brief and um, a bit of a. But thank you very much, and happy to answer any questions.